السلام عليكم ورحمة الله نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الدالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما فلما سلوا وسلم بارك على سيدنا ولان محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا سلاة وسلاما عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم You know, last week I was actually intending on talking about Sulay uh, Hudaybiyah, but um, we kind of kind of diverted and started talking about Bibi Fatima, salamu uh, alayha, because of some of the things that are going on you know, within the haram. And I was going to talk about it from a different perspective than what I'm going to talk about it today. So... Uh, Brother Abu Bakr, who's not here this week, inshallah, he'll be back. he's out of town, so he'll be back next week. But he's intending on going for Hajj. So we'll start talking about that, and inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, make the way easy for him with everything that's going on. Uh, and because he had intended on making it last year, uh, but, you know, with the lockdown, of course, uh, that didn't happen. So, inshallah, uh, Allah will make it easy for him this year, inshallah. And the reason I'm going to talk about it from the different perspective is that, you know, with things going on, somebody sent me a clip where there is a scholar that is trying to draw the analogy between what they call the Abrahamic Accords and Sulayh Hudaybiyah. Uh, for those who don't know, the Abrahamic Accords are the agreements uh, between these certain Muslim countries, Sudan, Morocco, UAE, uh, Bahrain, uh, Saudi was going to be a part of it, uh, but then certain things happened, so they postponed it. doesn't mean they're not going to do it, but they just postponed it. Which is an agreement between these countries and Israel where they normalize relations. So they acknowledge Israel as a state, uh, and they exchange ambassadors uh, and consulates and open trade. And that's the main point is... You know, for all of this, you know, unfortunately, you know, with everything, if you follow the money, it tells you a lot of things. So a lot of these things, you know, is trying to get the rich richer while the poor are pushed down at the expense of the believers. So I'm going to say a lot of things without saying things. Our Sheikh used to say after he would speak, he would say, Fahman wa Fahma. Whoever understood, understood. You know. If you don't understand, I can't help you. <laughs> okay. So uh, but, uh, So if you look at the Abrahamic Accords, you know, the agreement again is that they will acknowledge Israel as a state, you normalize relations, you normalize trade. So, you know, each country now is making a lot more money. Uh, or rather, the leaders of each country are making a lot more money. And, you know, and certain people are, are allowed to move somewhat freely in certain areas. Okay. Uh, on the other side, Israel agreed to suspend settlement expansion. Okay. Not to stop it but to suspend it, and there's no specification for how long it will be suspended. So basically, as soon as the embassies are made, they can start expansion again, or even before that. You know, as soon as the, the, the uh, dotted line is signed, okay, so there's no 
you know, there's no requirements on them. To understand Sulah Hudaybiyah, you know, Hudaybiyah occurred in the sixth year of Hijri. So this is after the Battle of Khandaq. Khandaq was in the fifth year. So you have Badr, Uhud, and Khandaq, three major battles. You had small, smaller battles in between. And so this year, Rasulullah has a general overview. You know, he sees a dream in which he's, he enters the Kaaba, he enters the Haram, with his companions in peace. The dreams of the prophets are true. They are part of revelation. And so when he mentions this to the companions the next day, everybody is, ah, oh, let's go right now. Yeah. No one wants to wait. You know, they haven't seen the Kaaba for six years. They are longing to see it. Even the people of the Ansar haven't been allowed to go and make Umrah. And those who did, some of them were, were even killed. So they're longing for this. And so all of them are saying, let's go now. So Rasulullah says, he agrees, let's go. So 1,400 companions, along with Rasulullah, they set out in Ihram with their swords in their sheath. Okay? Because when you go out for war, you know, you go out prepared. In Arabia at that time, a sword in the, a sword in the sheath was not considered an act of aggression. This was normal. You know, you know, if you weren't carrying something, you know, kind of, what's wrong with you? Yeah. When they set out, of course, Quraysh realizes, oh, they're coming. And so they sent Khalid bin Walid and Akram bin, Abu, Akram bin Abi Jahl to go and stop them. I had, you know, they sent a cavalry of 200 men to go and try to stop them from entering Mecca. Rasulullah Sussam consults with his companions. Abu Bakr says, Ya Rasulullah Sussam, you know, we did not come to fight. We came to make Umrah. So let's continue. And if they, you know, fight or, or are the aggressors, then we will defend ourselves. So Rasulullah stops with the rest of the companions and asks, who knows another way in? And one of them took them all the way around to the south side of Mecca, to Hudaybiyah. And when they arrived in Hudaybiyah, the camel of Rasulullah stops. Baswa will not move any forward. And the companions are trying to push her and, and stuff to get her to keep moving. And they're saying, oh, you know, she's so stubborn. And Rasulullah that is not in her nature. I mean, this is the camel of Rasulullah. So she says, this is not in her nature. The same force has stopped her that stopped the elephant of Abraha. You know, if you remember the story of Abraha, when he came, Mahmud, who was the white big elephant, you know, when he... When he when they would point him toward the Kaaba, he would not move. When they would turn him around, he would go. So Rasulullah says that the same force that stopped that elephant has stopped her. She knows where to sit. And when the companions, when they realize, because I'm going to skip a lot of details, when they realize, you know, that they're not going anywhere, they also realize that Rasulullah is willing to make a deal with Quraysh. Because Rasulullah himself, he says that I, by, by, he swears by Allah, he says, by him who holds my soul in his hand. That if Quraysh, you know, I will accept any proposal from Quraysh that establishes good relations <coughs> and guarantees the respect of, of the sanctities of Allah, of those places that are sacred to Allah, including the Kaaba, which was actually here that the, the, the reference was to the Kaaba, because part of the sanctity of the Kaaba is whoever enters it is in peace. You know. Whereas when the Muslims would try to enter it, they were not in peace. So that's one. I mean, even if you look at the, this, this statement, and then you look at the accords, and what's going on today, Al-Aqsa is also a 
a sanctity of Allah. So when we see this, then you know right off the bat, okay, it doesn't add up. This analogy that these so-called scholars are giving does not fit. When you look at scholars, and again, as I said, follow the money. You need to also look at who are they connected with. Who's funding them? That tells you a lot. This is why Imam Abu Hanifa, rahmatullahi three times he refused to be Chief Justice. Once he was offered it by Banu Umayyah, twice by Banu Abbas. Each time he said no. The last time they killed him for it. So he gave his life, but he did not agree to be Chief Justice. Because he said, if I become Chief Justice, I'm part of the system. Now I, now I do what they tell me to do. His student, Abu Yusuf, accepted the position. And people think that Imam Abu Hanifa was fine with it. He was not fine with it. He challenged him on it. He asked him ten questions that Abu Yusuf could not answer. And this is also why when you look at the fatwas of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Muhammad, who's another uh, major student of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Muhammad Shaibani, you know, most of their fatwas coincide, whereas Abu Yusuf has other fatwas that fall outside of that realm. You know, if you look at the Khilafah, the Khilafah of Rasulullah which lasted for 30 years, you look at the way they ruled, it was very different than other rulers. The way they ruled was service. They served their people. And they considered themselves as servants of the people. Of course, they're servants of Allah first, but they're servants of the people that they look after. Which is why when Omar Radio stood up, a simple man could challenge him on where did this shirt come from. When he made a ruling, an old woman could challenge him. How can you limit the mahr? And when they were challenged on these things, how did they respond? They were thankful to the ones who challenged them. Allah has sent a people who will set me straight. Whereas now, you challenge the ruler, and what happens? If you don't end up dead, you're in prison, and also labeled crazy and whatever else. So you get all these labels. If you look at all of the treaties, Rasulullah SAW made, whether it was with the Jews of Medina Munawwara when he, when he came, or even Sulih Hudaybiyah, or any other clan that he made a treaty with. All of them were made with the upper hand. They were very fair and balanced treaties. Of course, this is the other of Rasulullah SAW, the justice of Rasulullah SAW. But they were made in a position where if somebody violated the treaty, then the believers had recourse. And Surah Hudaybiyah is no different. You know, people, again, the analogy that they try to make here is that, oh, see, you know, the believers uh, were upset with the treaty. And we're going to go into that too, inshallah. And the terms of the treaty were all in favor of Quraysh. Which if you actually start analyzing it, it's not. The, you know, again, when we look at the treaty itself, the stipulations of the treaty are what? Is that all hostilities between all parties will cease, period. 
meaning that the Muslims will not show any hostility against Quraysh, and Quraysh will have no hostilities against the believers. Those who leave Quraysh and come to Rasulullah if they have done so without the permission of their, of their leader of their clan, then they are to be returned. Those who leave Rasulullah and come to Quraysh do not need to be returned. They will not be returned. If you actually analyze this from the standpoint of the believers, good riddance. There will be no theft or treachery between the parties. Anyone, any clan or anyone who wishes to make an alliance with the Rasulullah is free to do so. And anyone who wishes to make an alliance with Quraysh is free to do so. And then this year, the Muslims will not make Umrah. They will go back without making Umrah. But they will be allowed to come next year, and Quraysh will leave Mecca, and the believers will be allowed for three days to enter the city and do the Umrah as they please. If you look at the negotiations that were going on you know, before the treaty is finalized, Quraysh, you know, and if you look at the conditions of Quraysh, Quraysh literally were decimated. When you look at what happened at Khandaq and how they had to, to leave. and all of the things, they realized, they knew that there's no, that they don't have the strength to fight them. You know, when the Rasul, otherwise they would have attacked immediately. I mean, this is Quraysh. When the Rasulullah arrives in Hudaybiyah, they send an envoy. First envoy comes back to them and says, look, make peace with him. They say, ah, we don't want to listen to you. So they send another one. He comes back, same thing, look, make peace with him. He wants to make peace. He didn't come to fight. Ah, we don't want to listen to you either. Third one he said, said to first two spoke with the Rasulullah The third one, as he was walking toward the believers, the Rasulullah looked at him and told the believers, he said, this man is a man of religion. Simply take the animals of sacrifice out and show him. They did that, he walked away, comes back to Quraysh, look, this man, he wants peace, make peace with him. The fourth man was finally Urwa bin Masood, a Thaqafi, you know, from Banu Thaqi, from Daif. His mother was from Quraysh, his father is from, from Daif. You know, well respected throughout Arabia and outside of Arabia. So they send him, but before they send him, he says, look, I saw what you did with the other three. You're not going to treat me like that. You know, because they, they kind of shame them. You're not going to treat me like that. If I go, you know, I brought my men to support you, but if I go, you treat me well. When I come back and tell you whatever I need to tell you. Is that okay? Fine, go. He meets with the Rasulullah. He speaks with him. He tests the waters as to how he deals with the Rasulullah and he sees the response of the companions. He comes back to Quraysh and he tells them, he says, look, I have been an envoy to Qisra, you know, the Persian emperor, to Qaisr, the Byzantine emperor, to Najashi, the Abyssinian emperor, and never in my life have I ever seen anyone so respected and honored as Rasulullah is by his companions. He simply motions something and they're immediately trying to fulfill his, his desire. When he makes wudu, they don't let the water touch the ground before they take it in their hands. And anyone who doesn't get it in his hands touches the one who does. If he spits, they don't let his spit touch the ground. His blessed saliva, they take it. He says, you cannot fight these people. There's no way for you to fight these people, so make peace with him. And they tell him, well, look, you know, we're not going to disrespect to you, but we don't want to listen to what you have to say either. 
So this is when eventually Rasulullah sends Uthman. And after sending one ambassador and they tried to kill him. So eventually Rasulullah sends Uthman radiallahu because he has relatives there. He's from Banu Umayyah. So the interesting thing is though when he comes, you know, they treat him well. He secretly, while he's in, in Mecca, he meets with believers there that no one knows. You know, Rasulullah had given him a task as well. So he secretly meets with them. And he tells them that soon, you know, you will be able to declare your faith openly. Just be patient. On his way back, they say, look, you know, you're here. Why don't you make tawaf? This was the desire of all of all of these people that had come from Medina Munawar, 1,400 of them, that they should enter Makkah and make tawaf. You know, the orders are when you enter Makkah, first thing you do, make tawaf. Last thing that you do when you're leaving, make tawaf. When he'd come in, he didn't make tawaf. They noticed that. Now as he's leaving, they say, oh, you know, you're, you're here. So make tawaf. <coughs> and he says to them, he says, How can I make tawaf when you will not allow Rasulullah to make tawaf? This annoyed them. So they arrested him. They detained him. Word spreads to the Muslims that he's been martyred. You know, because he isn't back in time and they know what they tried, he, they tried to do with the first ambassador. So all of them are up in arms that we will go and take revenge for Uthman. Rasulullah sits under the tree there in Hudaybiya and he takes an oath from 1400 of them. And then in the end, you know, he puts his left hand in his right hand and says, this is the hand of Uthman. Which of course tells us he knew, because you can't take an oath from a dead man. This is the hand of Uthman and the oath of Uthman. Of course, when Quraysh hear this, oh, yeah. and now it's okay. We need to. We really need to make peace with him. <coughs> so this is when they make this peace. But if you look at the details again, the upper hand is whose? The Rasulullah's. So. When they violated the treaty two years later, who was in a position? to come and deal with matters. Rasulullah Today, if treaties are violated, and they're violated every day, you know, this resolution and that resolution has not, no meaning. You know, and these so-called Muslim leaders that are signing these treaties, they're not signing them for the good of the believers. They're signing them so they can keep their position, their superficial positions, and get richer. So to draw this analogy with the Abrahamic Accords and Suleh Hadabia, oh, see, you know, we need to listen to our leaders. Yeah, we need to listen to our leaders that are on the path of Allah and His Messenger. No, not those leaders <coughs> that are opposite of that path. <coughs> Supporting those forces that steal our iman. You know, because again, you know, when you look at these fatwa council this and, and so and so sheikh this and that, again, where's the funding coming from? Yeah, I mean, this is, and, and the interesting thing is, if you look in the Muslim world these days, this is something that goes from the bottom all the way to the top. You know, you go to a local masjid, and whoever paying, is paying the imam's salary, well, that's the talk that's spoken. If you go to 
And then you go, you know, government level, you know, they have their fatwa machine, so when the, when the ruler decides something, you know, they, they all have, oh, we've got to justify this. Make everybody fall in line. Ah, oh, see? You know, you have to listen to your rulers. This is also why these people, they never speak about Imam Hussein al-Islam. They never speak about Imam Zaid or Imam Muhammad nafs Zakia or any of these from Ahlul Bayt who led revolutions against the rulers. Or Sulaiman bin Sarad radiallahu anhu, who was a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi who led a revolution against the rulers. Or Abdullah ibn Zubair radiallahu anhu, again who led a revolution against the rulers. Because it doesn't fit their agenda. To the extent, you know, you, the fatwa machine is so strong, and there's a so-called scholar, and I say so-called, everybody says he's a scholar, uh, Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi. I'll tell you why, he's, uh, why I say so-called scholar. Yeah. He's a contemporary of Ghazali. So this is what, like 400 years after, 4, 450 or so Hijri. He was in Andalusia. He wrote tafsir. He wrote one that was 30 volumes, which was eventually lost uh, when Spain was, was overturned. You know, you had the, uh, the uh, where the Christian, uh, ex 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 I'm blanking on the term, uh, the, not the Crusades, uh, this is, but when the uh, Inquisition. Inquisition, Inquisition, yes. The Spanish Inquisition, Jazakallah. Yeah. So those were lost. But he wrote another tafsir that's four volumes, Ahkam al Quran, dealing with the Ahkam of the Quran, the orders, the laws of the Quran. Tafsir only on that. In that, he makes a comment. He says that Imam Hussein al Islam was killed by his own grandfather's sword. That's the one. Because you cannot rise up against the leader. And then they quote the hadith. But the hadiths are talking about leaders that are in line with Allah and, and the orders of Allah and His Messenger. If you look at all of the leaders in the Muslim world today and how they came to power, none of them are legitimate. They have no legitimacy. So for them to tell us, oh, you can't, you can't say anything against me. I'm your leader. Whatever I decide is for the good of the, of the, of, of the believers. You have to be, be a believer first. Unfortunately, you know, this is also a reflection of the people. You know, because if you look at the masses, if you put them in that same position, they'd be doing the same thing. And that's the way we become. You know, for a few pennies, we sell our, our, our iman. And for a few pennies, we're willing to abandon those that are being oppressed and defend those that are oppressing. Again, you look at Philistine. For 70 years this has been going on. Kashmir, the same thing. 70 years this has been going on. And what do we get? We get lip service. When it happens, the leaders come, oh, we're appalled at this. How can you do this? And then they quiet it down. It's still going on. Just different level. You know, inch by inch killing and taking the land of the Muslims. There are no rush, but we're blind to it all. <coughs> and
And the only way, as we spoke, for those who are here in Eid, the only way for the help of Allah to come is for us to go back, to connect ourselves back with the Rasulullah. And again, the reason he told us all of these things that we see are happening, is he already told us these things are going to happen, is that we know where to stand. You know, it used to be, okay, you had a line in the sand. You know, are you on this side or are you on that side? Are you on the forces? Of, are you with the forces of Yazid or are you with the forces of Imam Hussein al hmm? Now you have so many intersecting lines <coughs> that people get confused. Okay, which way? Do, where do I stand? That's why he told us all of these things, so that we know where to stand. And a basic principle is you stand for those who are oppressed against those who oppress. <coughs> so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us uh, and uh, guide us and, and fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad wasallam, his family, his companions, and all of those whom they love, inshallah. Those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah, inshallah.